Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Cordover, and I'm the founding director of the ASU Banner Neurodegenerative Disease Research Center at Arizona State University. I'm excited to be the moderator of today's session, and we have a outstanding lineup of world-renowned scientists who are all passionate about studying multiple system atrophy. We have Dr. Lucy Northcliffe Kaufman. We have Dr. Patrick Brunden. We have Dr. Ronald Melke. Uh, we have Dr. Sarah Hollick, Dr. Michael Henderson, Dr. Vuda Pilitz, Dr. Amber Van Leer, and Dr. Um, Ziv Gan Orr, and Dr. Sandra Bettenhausen. And we'll go around and ask questions. Uh, but before, uh, although all of them have given talks at this uh, conference, um, Dr. Van Leer has not, but she's been invited here because she's got some very exciting news to share with us with regards to a clinical trial that she's involved with, with MSA. So Dr. Van Leer, would you just inform the, the audience here about what's going on with S-Bio? Uh, yeah, so um, thank you for having an opportunity here to uh, let everyone know about the study. Um, just for clarity, it has not started yet, but we're looking to open this up very, very soon. And so I wanted to make sure it was brought to the attention of the MSA community. Um, so in short, we're using gene therapy as potential uh, treatment for MSA. Um, and um, I'm not sure if anyone here was able to attend the talk yesterday, but we're using basically brain surgery to help us uh, deliver this therapy directly to a part of the brain that's affected by MSA. So we're going right to the butamen. We're using a drug, it's called AAV2 GDNF. So this is a type of gene therapy that we have a lot of experience with, with Parkinson's disease. And so we have um, good reason to think it may be a good start, starting place at least for looking at MSA. It turns out that when we look at uh, tissue from patients who have passed away and we look right in their putamen, they have very low levels of GDNF. And so this is an opportunity for us to directly replace GDNF in this part of the brain um, that's really uh, insufficient. We have a lot of reason to think that based off of what we know from Parkinson's disease and even some animal models of MSA looking at GDNF replacement, we have some reason to think this might be um, successful. So um, just wanted to bring some of that to everyone's attention today um, and happy to answer more questions about it. I think there's a few that are coming through already. So um, you mentioned that it's brain surgery. And um, I once got uh, assaulted verbally by my dear friend, um, Andres Lozano, that I called it minor brain surgery. Um, <laughs> there's no minor brain surgery. But there's an evolution now about using focus ultrasound to, without surgery, delivering, opening up the blood-brain barrier, and delivering proteins that normally don't get into the brain. Is that something that that s might be considering down the road? Yeah, it's definitely being looked at. I think that they're still, it's still not um, perfected yet, let's say. I think there's still concerns about getting enough um, of your, your actual gene therapy product and making sure it's going to the places where you want it to go. One of the big benefits of doing the delivery that we're doing is we actually are kind of taking advantage of the, um, the network that's already been established, the nigrostriatal network or the strato. Uh, nigral network. So we're taking advantage of that to really not just affect the um, putaminal cells that are there, but also the entire ni striatal nigral um, trajectory as well. And I, I, it's harder, I think, to get enough of a vector in the right spot in order to um, achieve that same transduction if we're using the uh, focus ultrasound, but maybe there are ways to enhance this to get this better. There's other ways that we're also exploring to get around the direct delivery of gene therapy period, um, but that's also still in its infancy, it's, but uh, it's something that's still being explored. So we could potentially do IV delivery and, and uh, not have to mess around with direct delivery at all. Thank you very much. And, and this yep. is exclusively for MSAP versus MSAC. Yeah, so there's rarely you're going to find a purely, you know, MSAP patient. Like we, we understand that. Um, but we have reason to think that with, um, again, our experience with Parkinson's disease and just delivery to right to the putamen, that we have evidence to suggest that this is helpful really for the motor symptoms more than anything. And building off of that experience with, with Parkinson's, we, we have reason to think that this is, this approach at least is better for uh, folks who have more Parkinsonian type of symptoms. But this is still early days. Um, if there are cellular features, that's not an issue. We just wanna make sure that there are Parkinsonian features there because we think that's really what's gonna be benefited the most. Thank you very much. Dr. Melke. 
One of the things that's impressed me when I've seen patients with MSA is just how aggressive it is in most cases. There are some where it's not, but in most cases, it's just incredibly aggressive. Can you explain to us why you think that MSA is far more aggressive than Parkinson's disease in terms of its progression? Well, I'm convinced. Thank you for this very nice question. Uh, in fact, we don't know, but we can hypothesize. So what I can say is that the structure of MSA fibrils is different from the structure of PD fibrils. So you can imagine that the proteins and the cells that these fibrils interact with when they propagate uh, are different. Um, some potentially are the same, but also some are different. And it's, it, it, again, the surfaces of these fibrils that are important. The surfaces are not only the lateral surfaces, of course, but the ends as well. And it's through the ends that these fibrils grow and recruit endogenous FSA nuclei. So I think that they are very aggressive because of this, because they have different surfaces, they target different cells, but also they grow differently. They interact with proteins within the cells the, with maybe different proteins, and some are very important proteins. And what you need to understand is that when a fibril interact with a protein, it sequesters the protein. So in fact, we are sort of mimicking a loss of function. And it is through losses of function, multiple losses of function that we have pathology. Thank you. Dr. Peelers, as we were talking, um, there's some controversy with regards to where the GCI, where the synuclein comes from for the GCIs, the glial cell inclusions. Um, early studies showed a lack of mRNA in the oligos, and later studies are showing uh, that there can be mRNA. Could you expound upon that and, and clarify that for us? Yes, I, I, I also find that a, a, a very interesting and intriguing question because um, in order to really have pathology in these oligodendrocytes like and to have MSA to develop and progress, I also believe there has to be expression of alpha synuclein protein within these cells. And so um, these building blocks, alpha synuclein monomers, I think therefore has to be present within the oligodendrocytes. And so some people have um, come up with a few ideas or, or uh, a few hypotheses as to how um, these oligodendrocytes are expressing alpha synuclein. Now, one way how the synuclein might end up in the oligodendrocyte is by uh, transfer from neurons to oligodendrocytes, and that might lead to a buildup of the protein itself within the cells. Another idea or another hypothesis that's being uh, discussed is that um, some sort of trigger might actually um, <clears throat> trigger the expression of alpha synuclein within oligo oligodendrocytes, you know, even in a transient manner. Um, what, what is, I think, more established is that in multiple system atrophy, these oligodendrocytes have an impairment in uh, the deg degradation machinery that they cannot clear alpha synuclein as efficiently as, for instance, normal people do. And that might, for instance, also allow a buildup of, of uh, alpha synuclein and then those toxic species that I think Ronald has, has talked about so much. Um, but how this exactly happens and, and where this, this synuclein is actually coming from in these oligodendrocytes is, is not very well known. So let me follow up. Um, you're a world leader in, in the area of animal models of, of MSA. And so if you had a therapy that you thought would be helpful in patients with MSA, which model would you choose? And hopefully um, so you'll say the model that I work. <laughs> I'm sorry, can we come in? <laughs> Go ahead. Just which model would you choose? Going so I, I, would, I would certainly choose a model where there's expression of alpha synuclein in these oligodendrocytes, and then so leading to the accumulation of the protein. Uh, and this is something that we've also seen, and, and this is very consistent. You know, once you overexpress or express the protein uh, in transgenic models of, of multiple system atrophy, then this will automatically lead to, to deficits, demyelination, uh, even you know, several of, of the motor symptoms that we, uh, we see in people with multiple system atrophy. Uh, so ev even though we don't exactly know how this disease starts and, and, and where even the protein is coming from, I, I think it's, it's a valuable model because it can still uh, tell us much about the disease and it can still tell us uh, and, and give us good information about how to treat and, and target um, uh, this disease. So, so I, I think for now, this is probably one of our, our best 
model so far. But, but I also would uh, note and mention that uh, we have to better understand how this disease uh, comes about, how it develops, uh, and by doing so, hopefully developing animal models that mimic the disease much better than they, than they do today. Thank you. Um, Dr. Genor, could you explain what epigenetics is and do they play a role in MSA? Sure, uh, I can. I think maybe there are also some other people here who can answer this question uh, just as good as me. Epigenetics is, um, is a general name for a mechanism that, by which external stimuli can, uh, can control or can uh, guide how DNA is being uh, transcribed and translated in the cells. In other words, Epigenetics uh, is uh, a way of the cell to control whether a certain gene or a certain protein would be expressed and to which level. Now that can be, epigenetics can be affected by, by many things. It can be affected by medications, by uh, every environmental uh, exposure that we have can affect our epigenetics. And uh, unfortunately, we don't know much about how epigenetics uh, affect MSA and what role exactly does it have. Um, and it's quite complicated to study because of the exact same reason that I mentioned, because there are so many things that can affect epigenetics. And if you test it in, in, in different people, or even if you test it in the same people, over time you will see changes uh, in the same individuals. So it's hard to say what is the, uh, currently it's hard to say what's the, what is the contribution of epigenetics to MSA. Okay, hey, thank you. Dr. Brunden, there are different forms of MSA. Uh, a questioner asked, why don't they use MSA A anymore? And could you compare and contrast the forms of MSA that are seen in Japan versus North America and Europe? So I must say, I almost feel like I'm back in school. I'm nervously waiting for my question. <laughs> and I got a tricky one. <laughs> it's true, there are different forms of MSA, and they are based on the anatomical distribution of the pathology and as a consequence, the types of symptoms. And the most commonly occurring ones are the MSAP, where the P stands for Parkinsonism, where the basal ganglia are affected and one sees symptoms that are, of course are similar to Parkinson's disease, slowness of movement, rigidity, and so forth. The other major form is MSA-C, where the C stands for cerebellum, where the um, uh, pathways that are connecting the cerebellum to the rest of the nervous system are also affected. And they have slightly different types of symptoms, more related to coordination of ongoing movements. And the question is, I think one should ask the question, should we even call these diseases the same thing? It might be confusing us a little bit because even though they both have the aggregates that we just talked about in oligodendrocytes as a, a major feature, they are so different in their um, uh, distribution of pathology, et cetera. So they might actually be two totally different entities. And if you think of what I spoke about in my presentation, one would then suggest that the MSA, MSAP cases would be completely distinct from MSAC in terms of their origin. So a urinary tract infection would most likely not have anything to do with MSAP because the distribution of the pathology is so different. It has no connection to the urinary tract. And um, I think we would probably learn a lot more if we decided in the genetic studies and all the epidemiology studies and all the animal model studies, all the protein aggregate types of studies to distinguish between these two forms, these major clusters straight away. And as you hinted, they're slightly different um, uh, frequencies of these forms in, in Asia and in the Western hemisphere. Thank you. Dr. Henderson, some MSA patients have dementia. Do you think that it's the alpha synuclein aggregates that are involved in that uh, symptomatology, or do you think there's copathologies such as tau or amyloid that are participating in the cognitive decline in some uh, MSA patients? Yeah, that's a great question. 
So uh, for Parkinson's disease, for example, while we think of Lewy bodies as the primary pathology, we know that as disease progresses, these patients can accumulate additional pathologies, uh, such as the tau tangles and amyloid plaques that you would see in Alzheimer's disease. And these have some correlation with the progression of these patients to dementia. So does this happen in MSA? Uh, I'm not as familiar with the literature. Uh, I think we've just not done as many studies on what the co-pathologies that may modify MSA are, but certainly you could also imagine that if, for example, you get a ligodendrocyte, these uh, gliocytoplasma conclusions in areas that control cognitive function, then you, that itself could also lead to cognitive impairment as well. So um, great question. I think it's possible there's modifying code pathologies, but probably more work needs to be done there. Thank you. Dr. Holick, um, is there any way to bust the fold of the proteins will straighten them out? In the laboratory, there is. Um, <laughs> that's a, it's a, we commonly use a chemical, or mul there's multiple chemicals we can use to kind of straighten out the protein, and that's one of the ways that we can differentiate between different strains of protein-caused diseases. Uh, in patients, however, in terms of thinking, can we do this in a patient? that's a lot more tricky because anything we would use to unfold a protein in the laboratory would unfold all of the proteins. And so naturally that's probably not something we could ever use as a therapeutic, but it's very useful for researchers to understand how this folding can then lead to disease. So that's something that um, we work on and yes, we can bust the fold in the laboratory. <laughs> Well, you could also prevent the fold from ever occurring. You could use things yes. like antibodies or immunotherapies, and, and uh, those are, have clinical utility going down the road. Yes. Okay, Dr. Northcliffe Kaufman, um, how long are natural history studies, and they, are they normally a precursor to interventional studies? So the natural history studies usually run for a good number of years. Um, and they can involve an, an intense, like the, the, they can involve an intense period of being following and uh, followed and then usually a period where patients are called in or do remote visits to be followed. It depends on how the study is set up. up. The current one, um, the natural history study that, that we've, all, a lot of us have participated in has been going on for almost a decade. So quite often those studies, because they're such a wealth of information, they keep um, adding and adding more years as they follow patients through. But if you're considering participating in a natural history study, you should think of it kind of in terms of like it's going to follow you, you know, throughout your lifespan and track the clinical stages. Because one of the most important things about those studies is they capture all phases of disease, including, you know, the later stages. They, and in terms of the second question about whether they're always a precursor for an interventional study, I think the way to think about it is that, is that these two are complementary and that the information generated during a natural history study do, su supports um, multiple clinical, interventional clinical trials in terms of knowledge and understanding. So we'll understand better how those diseases, how MSA evolves, how to track it over time, and they can be used to develop or refine new scales to, to measure progression. So they really are sort of complementary and one doesn't necessarily, and the, the, the interventional trials don't necessarily follow on from that, but there's a lot of interplay between the two that they can help help um, support clinical trials in multiple different ways. Um, we, I, hope that, I hope that answers the question. I know we had um, you know, a lot of questions about who can participate in this and whether you need a, a caregiver. That was one question that came in from the audience. But I just you know, want to emphasize that these studies are available to anyone with MSA. It doesn't matter on the disease stage and you can participate with or without a caregiver. And can Canadians get involved with track MSA? The, the, 
track with track MSA not directly involved because it's being currently carried out at two clinical sites because there's a need within the natural history studies to, to you know keep things in this early stage of very intense follow-up um at, at sites where we can standardize the measuring techniques and know if we're we're tracking something that's worthwhile or tracking something that doesn't follow the disease progression but having said that you know the nat natural history studies are, are very collaborative right so you know keep checking back to see if like other um, sites have been added which and generally the goal is to to put together as many sites to contribute as possible because there's a wealth in having more information okay thank you very much um dr uh ganor uh, it, there's uh, someone in the audience who's interested in rbd and is RBD a prodromal uh, symptom of MSA? And if so, is there something that someone can do to prevent the evolution in, from uh, RBD to PD and MSA? Thank you for the question. So RBD can progress into Parkinson's disease, dementia with fluid bodies or multiple system atrophy, but only a small minority of people with RBD, about 5% of them will develop multiple system atrophy. Um, it's very common in multiple system atrophy, but some people develop it after uh, MSA starts. In terms of if there's anything that can be done about it, unfortunately, there is no way uh, currently to slow down the disease progress, uh, as far as we know, maybe expert, except for doing uh, some, um, some physical activity. But uh, and which is true for for Parkinson's disease, but for MSA we don't have studies specifically about that. And uh, as I said, there's no specific recommendation that I can give. Okay, thank you, Dr. Melky. So, so sorry, could I just add that because sure, I saw just ahead. below, yeah, below that question there was another BD question, not RBD but IBD, and IBD uh -huh. is inflammatory bowel disease as opposed to REM sleep behavior disorder, totally different conditions, very similar abbreviations. But there is a link between IBD and multiple system atrophy, and uh, Dr. Ganor apparently mentioned this in his talk. I was not able to listen right then. But it's a paper that came out earlier this year that suggests there's overlap in the genetics of inflammatory bowel disease and multiple system atrophy, which is very interesting in many ways. One could imagine that uh, there's a common cause that can manifest in two. One could also imagine that uh, inflammatory bowel disease is a risk factor for MSA because uh, when we talked about the urinary bladder, we only talk about the urinary bladder in our experiments because that's what we've been experimenting with. But the nerves that innervate the urinary bladder overlap with the nerves that innervate the lowest part of the uh, intestine, so the rectum. And proctitis, inflammation of the lowest part of the intestine is very common in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So no one could speculate, and this is just speculation, that inflammation in that region would trigger sinucleinopathy in the nerve endings that then would lead to the spinal cord segments two to four of the sacral spinal cord. And this could be the common link. Totally speculation, but it's an intriguing speculation. Thank you, Dr. Brunton. Dr. Melke, uh, could you address the issue of mitochondrial uh, dysfunction in MSA? And is there something that we could do to correct that? Well, unfortunately, this is a, an important question again. And um, unfortunately, what we cannot really much act on mitochondria. What we need to do is act ahead of having the fibrils getting inside our cells and multiply and affecting the mitochondrial integrity. So uh, we really need to target these aggregates. I mean, we have now evidence that these aggregates form way, I mean, a long time before they are found in the brain uh, in the periphery, uh, and they can be used, of course, to, to diagnose the disease to some extent, but um, I think we need really to target them uh, with antibodies, as you mentioned at one point, with other ligands, and we are trying to develop such ligands before they get inside our cells and cause, you know, the, the damages they cause. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henderson, um, are there other proteins involved in MSA besides alpha-synuclein in terms of pathology? Yeah, that's a good question too. So alpha-synuclein is what we use to kind of mark which neurons, or in the case of MSA, which ligandinocytes are affected by pathology. But certainly they're not the only proteins that are present in pathology. There are a lot of other proteins that become incorporated in these inclusions. There's kinases, there's organelles. And so um, what these inclusions may be doing is disrupting some cellular functions related to these other proteins. And so, um, so what's interesting about MSA that's different than Parkinson's disease is the cell type. And uh, so Walter briefly mentioned this study that found that if you have pathology that begins in oligodendrocytes, it's much more potent. Uh, and that what that study had proposed was that it's actually the cellular environment of oligodendrocytes that somehow modifies that pathology in a way that, that makes it more pathogenic. So, so that's a long answer to say, yes, there are other proteins involved. We don't know the identity of all those, but certainly in differentiating PD and uh, MSA, there may be uh, really important different uh, cell type environments that, that modify that pathology in the way that it acts in the brain. Thank you. Dr. Wu, any way to get these cells that are lost back? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, that's maybe a question that I, I could also ask uh, Patrick maybe in a bit, but um, well, and, and of course you as well, um, Jeff, but so the, you know, there's of course, you know, potentially you know, stem cell therapy there. I'm, I'm not, sure, not sure if this would also be uh, a, a good strategy for multiple system atrophy since the pathology is so different there because you also have a lot of, uh, you know, striatal neuronal loss. Um, but, um, but, but, but I think I, I, I should ask this question to, uh, to probably the, the both of you because I think you'll, you'll also have a good answer to that as well. So if I was going to answer, go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> so um, given the lack of other therapeutic avenues right now, I think trying um, stem cell transplants in a patient with um, MSA is not an unreasonable path going forward. Um, we know that we can get striatal cells to survive in animal miles. We can get nigral cells to survive in animal, animal miles and in patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, we know that the safety profile is pretty good. And so I think that it's not an unreasonable approach to uh, replace these neurons with stem cells. Patrick. Yeah, so I'd echo that, but I would also want to emphasize that it might be mostly for the MSAP type of disease where the basal ganglia are primarily affected. And there were several studies about 20, 25 years ago in, in animal models of MSA where in particular, the group from uh, uh, Innsbruck in Austria transplanted uh, cells to, I think, as you were suggesting, both dopamine neurons and striatal neurons mixed. I would also argue that it would be a challenge to reconstruct the circuitry because of two different populations being affected. And I would also say that MSAC, it would be hard to know what cell type to transplant and exactly where. So MSA, MSA, P, I think, yes, it might be worth trying because of the lack of other therapies. Would you put the nigral um, stem cells in striatum and the striatal stem cells in nigral? Would that be an easier path for well, that's, Yeah, that's an interesting concept. I think the uh, group with um, Gregor Vanning, Vanna Perver, and Nadia Stefanova, who did this initial work, if I remember 20, 25 years ago, they, I think they mixed cells and put them in the striatum. This is my recollection. So, and Dr. Van Leeuwen. Only in the straight term. Okay. Dr. Just, Van uh, Let me just ask a quick, quick yeah. question of you. So, um, the um, gene delivery of GDNF has had a bit of a checkered path, pass, pass of, for Parkinson's disease. What gives you optimism going forward for MSA? So I just wanted to add, there is a mesenchymal stem cell study that's being done. It's been looked at in, in MSA. Just want to throw that out there. Without the direct delivery, it's... Mesenchymal uh, yeah. stem cells don't want survive. Want to throw it out there. Right. 
<laughs> throwing yeah, it out yeah. there. Um, so, uh, with and then on, on top of that, you know, GDNF though it may not restore, you know, bring back cells that are dead, but there's potential. We were hoping that actually to maintain the health of the cells that are still there, maybe sick by you know the processes that are causing MSA, um, you know, but potentially restoring them back to health. So, not direct replacement, but restoring that way. Um, in regards to um, our gene therapy. Um, um, were you suggesting that as a, a like a different approach for, um, can you, re yeah, I was wondering if you could repeat your question. So Dr. Holick, as a person who does uh, neuropathology on human brain samples, um, it's been asked whether MSA proteins, which have a prion-like property, are toxic to researchers and other, and other uh, Um, I, you are froze, Jeff, for me anyway, so I'm not sure if there was more to the end of that question, but I'll answer what I heard. Uh, so there's no, there's no data that suggests that the, any misfolded alpha synuclein is dangerous to researchers themselves, uh, which is true for PRP prions, like Kuru and Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. So there's no data that suggests that it's dangerous to researchers, but um, out of an abundance of caution, our lab treats everything like it could potentially be dangerous just because it's a good rule of thumb when you work with any disease is to always treat it like it could harm you. So even though there is no danger of it to us that we know of, we treat it as if there could be. I also saw a question pop up um, in terms of if it's dangerous about like if people could give it to their family and that's kind of in the same vein of this question which is along with what I mentioned about Kuru being able to be transmitted um, between people or Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease getting that from eating infected um, meat like that's not something that we've ever seen happen with synucleinopathies. So I, that's not anything that anybody needs to worry about giving it to a family member. This is more of a, just a caution for researchers. There's, it's always better to be safe than sorry. I mean, I will tell you that Stan Prusner, Nobel laureate, believes that we should take extensive precautions handling MSA tissue because uh, he believes it is a, quote, prion. But I agree with your answer. Um, so, Dr. Genor, a couple of questions. Uh, is there precision medicine involving genetics happening now for MSA? And also, if you can follow that up with, how do you figure out if people uh, have an, a GBA mutation? Is it only after death, or can that be found out during life? Thank you for the question. So uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, other uh, members of the panel, but I don't know of any uh, current study that is uh, the, uh, targeting specific uh, uh, subpopulation in the sense of, from the point of view of genetics, which would, what, what we mean by precision medicine. So for example, uh, uh, targeting specifically people with uh, GBA mutations. So I'm not aware of any, try like that but if there is one feel free to to comment about this uh, as, as how to find if people have gba mutations we don't have to wait after that we can find it in blood of patients uh, so people who contribute blood or skin or any other sample basically that can be tested for dna we can test for uh, the presence of gba mutations having said that uh, just to comment that the the association between GBA mutations and MSA is really not clear. I talked about this in my talk. There is some evidence that support it. There is some evidence that do, that do not support it. And it's still unclear whether GBA mutations are really contributing to uh, MSA. Dr. North of Kaufman, um, why is it so difficult at times to diagnose MSA? Um, that's a big question, and it's an excellent question. I think the difficulty arises because um, it, MSA can have other diseases that mimic it, and then you have diagnostic criteria where 
we have to wait a certain amount of time in the clinic for people to have developed a sufficient amount of typical symptoms to be able to call, to call, to diagnose MSA, right? So you have this period of time where in, in clinic, where you see patients, you may suspect that they have early MSA, but it isn't until the point where they've lost a sufficient amount of neurons and they have, you know, the core features of the disease that, that we, we can make a clinical diagnosis. And then one of the things we, we, we know, we, the diagnosis is made at, at pathology, right? So by detecting the pathology that we're all talking about right now with these abnormal synuclein deposits. So that's the, you know, that's the definitive diagnosis, but we have these clinical stages. And then there can be other diseases that mimic MSA. So as we're, you know, sort of seeing patients in clinic and collectively, you know, putting our thoughts together, we're becoming better able to identify those earlier stages of MSA and come up with sort of criteria to be able to diagnose it and pick it up in in earlier stages. So let me follow up. Most, uh, and we talked about this early on in the discussion, uh, MSA is such an aggressive disease, but there are some patients who have very slowly progressive disease. Do we have any understanding as to why that population progresses slowly versus others are so aggressive? I mean, first of all, you know, that's absolutely right. And it's one key observation that we see. I mean, when when people when patients are given the diagnosis in clinic, there's often a temptation to look at, you know, average survival and things like that. But as we've tracked MSA patients over time, we we do understand there's a group of people that that, that progress very, very slowly, right? And and at pathology, they do have, you know, the, a definitive diagnosis. So, uh, you know, that's it. It, it becomes very interesting to follow those patients to understand what it is that is unique about them that causes the process to occur slower and, of course, be associated with longer survival. As to what's happening at a molecular level, you know, I don't think there's any better people to answer that than, than others on this call, right? So I wonder if there's anybody else that has ideas about what could be going on with at a molecular level. Yeah, I could add something here in the discussion. It's a very interesting and important question. And I think that what we need to say is essentially that we are not all alike. We do not have exactly the same genes and alleles. And it is through these combination of alleles that some will evolve and develop, unfortunately, the disease fast while others will develop it slower. We are not equal. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, you're not, to we're not equal. Go ahead, Patrick. Sir, Sir Ronald, uh, I'm surprised you didn't say that we're also not equal when it comes to the shape and form of those protein aggregates. Oh, there was a cat just went across uh, Sarah's screen. I don't know if you all saw it. A big black cat. Scary. Anyway, yeah. so, oh, you, are so, right. so uh, you know, you talk about spaghetti linguine and... Uh, macaroni type of shape aggregates. Do you think the initial shape of the aggregate could govern the speed of progression in some way? Forget Definitely. about the genes just for 20 seconds. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Definitely. And you are perfectly right. But what defines the shape of these pasta are the molecular chaperones, is, are our alleles that we are expressing to different extents. So... Let me uh, follow up, Dr. Melky. So um, we've shown that patients with one cardinal sign of Parkinson's disease have rampant synucleinopathies. Do you think MSA is the same? That, the, uh, that by the time we get a diagnosis, that the aggregates are already formed and we have to use that information to guide our therapeutic interventions? Definitely, uh, Jeff. So uh, the, the, the thing what is missing here are diagnostic tools. So tools that can distinguish one polymorph from another to sort of predict how things are going to evolve. Because we have been able to generate many polymorphs, as you know, including from patients. Uh, at the resolution we have, we have the impression that the polymorphs coming from different MSA patients sort of look alike. But, you know, we might discover that they are still different to some extent. But what we are missing are ligands that distinguish one polymorph from another. We, cannot, we can obviously not do like an 
cryo-electron microscopy structure from every single patient, including from, uh, you know, biopsies from the periphery. Dr. Peelers, um, what is your level of optimism about finding a biomarker for MSA? And where would that biomarker be? Would it be an imaging biomarker or CSF, blood? What do you think going forward? And do you think that that is one of our major unmet needs in terms of um, understanding MSA and finding a, a better way to, for therapeutics? Well, yeah, I'm absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and I think there my, my optimism is, is actually pretty high. Uh, and, and I think this also relates to some of the things that Ronald were just, was just mentioning. Um, and, and I think there has been some, um, um, I think, very exciting studies that have shown that even just with small samples of CS, CSF, you can actually detect some of those you know, specific aggregated uh, proteins in, in, for instance, you know, spinal cord uh, CSF samples from uh, people with multiple system atrophy. And it even allows to, to differentiate between uh, people with multiple system atrophy and, and people with Parkinson's disease. So I, I think this is, this is a, a very exciting field, I, and I think this is a very promising field. So, so my level of, of optimism is, is really high there. Thank you. Dr. Henderson, um, the microbiome is getting a lot of play in Parkinson's disease. Could you discuss a bit whether you think the microbiome plays a role in MSA? And if so, do you think that having, uh, taking prebiotics or probiotics would be a safe, easy therapeutic intervention for, um, for patients with MSA. I think maybe this would be best directed to Patrick and Walter. <laughs> I think that this is their uh, area of research, whether infectious diseases or in this case, maybe microbiome differences in individuals could somehow trigger or predispose this disease. I think I would leave them to answer that. All right, Patrick. And I was okay. so relieved that you got the question, Mike, <laughs> because, of course, I don't really know what the answer is, but I can speculate. And, Walter, you're welcome to chip in. Anything that can modulate inflammation in the gut, and we talked about the rectum, might be relevant for MSAC. And I said that about, uh, I think it's about 30% of people with inflammatory bowel disease have inflammations of the lowest part of the gut. So, so anything that can modulate that, you could potentially imagine plays a role. And there are some studies to microbiome and, and MSA, but it's, it's an emerging, evolving field. And I don't think there's anything definitive one can say. It's very complicated because there's so many different types of bacteria in the microbiome. Some seem to promote inflammation. Some seem to reduce inflammation. What do you say about it? I I I, um, I, I agree, and I, I think it's 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 a very interesting, let's say, proud or, or it's an interesting idea um, where different infectious um, triggers might you know either influence or, or even act as, as a cause or as a pure trigger of multiple system atrophy. Um, if if we for just for instance look at genetics, um, it's been very hard just to identify just risk factors or, or genes that might be associated or, or causative of multiple system atrophy. So clearly something else has, has to be happening there. And uh, so we've of course been using the the UTI model as just, just as a model to to study how the disease might start and just to have this as a sort of paradigm. Um, but but I think there could be other you know challenges or infections um, you know and as you know as as to that I'm just for instance thinking about you know certain even coronaviruses that can specifically infect for instance oligodendrocytes you know through the through the facial nerve uh, you know this, this has, has also been described and this has been a, a popular hypothesis in multiple sclerosis um, where you also have a lot of demyelination and and um, you know, several of the pathologies that actually overlap with that of multiple system atrophy. Uh, so so I, I, I think it's an interesting hypothesis and, and also for, uh, certainly for my future research, this is something I would like to dig into more. Um, um, so, so that's, uh, like I said, I, I, I think it's an interesting avenue, but it, there's absolutely not much known about it at this point. Dr. Holick, if I could give you a million dollars for one grant and you could have a choice, of three different avenues to study. Would it be misfolded proteins, autophagy, or inflammation? Mm. I don't know, I do love my misfolded protein. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I love them very much. Um, I, there's still a lot to learn, I think, about how one protein can adopt so many confirmations. Then as try as we may, I feel like we've barely touched the tip of that iceberg. Yeah, I actually would choose inflammation or autophagy because then you have all the co-pathologies uh, that you can address. So we have time for just one more question. I'm going to leave it to Dr. Van Leer. Um, there's a person in the audience who wants to know, is gene therapy dangerous? That's a really good question. And if, if you're not thinking about that, I would always make sure that it gets brought up because it's, it's important. So, um, you know, just like anytime we do brain surgery, there are risks that are involved. And though I don't think that this is minimally invasive as compared to other types of brain surgeries, this is, is minimal. Um, you know, I think we get into more trouble with brain surgery when you're actually taking a lot of stuff out and that's, that's not at all what we're doing. And we're also not leaving anything behind and that that's another uh, source of problems for other types of, of interventions for neurosurgery. Um, that being said, it's, it's still, you know, we're putting something in the brain. Anytime you're putting anything in the brain, there's always going to be a risk of things like bleeding and infection. We haven't seen any like types of infections that have occurred, but we, there have been cases where there have been small bleeds in a few patients. Um, these are in other studies, not, not in ours. Um, but that being said, they've been small. Um, it, and if they were symptomatic, they were mild and eventually resolved over time. Um, you know, the, the risks are not much different than things like deep brain stimulation. So just to keep that in mind, this is an FDA approved therapy where again, you're, you're implanting electrodes and they, they then stay inside the brain for a long period of time. So it's very similar to that. So it's, it's not without risk by no means, but um, for a lot of people, sometimes the risk uh, is worth, worth the effort of going through these types of studies. Well, thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the close of our session. I want to thank all my dear friends and experts in, in this area for their uh, time and their, and their insight. And with that, I will draw the session to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.